Good morning. Welcome to church on Sunday morning at Christ Church Lutheran. We want to say with the psalmist, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And today we begin a brand new sermon series on the book of Ephesians. Whether you're worshiping with us online or you're physically present here in the sanctuary, we want you to know that you've been chosen. The Bible says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. And what an incredible feeling that God, the creator of the universe, chose you to be in his family even before he created the beautiful heaven and the earth that that we enjoy today. We want to make our beginning in the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of this new day and this opportunity to know you and to walk with you by faith. We thank you that we've been chosen, we've been adopted as your children, sons and daughters of the King. And Lord, as we begin our worship service today, we pray for your spirit to fill us, to overflow in our lives, that we might bring hope and joy and peace to a world that's in darkness and in turmoil. We thank you that we are your children, dearly loved. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. We sing our opening song this morning, King of Kings.
Jesus began his Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. And the very first Beatitude is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When you think about those words, a life with God begins with humility. It begins with an acknowledgement that we've all sinned and we all fall short. The Bible says there is no one righteous on earth who does what is right and never sins. And beginning a relationship with God starts with acknowledging that we've sinned. There's a story in the Bible about two men who went to the temple to pray. One who was arrogant and prideful, he was a Pharisee. And the other, a tax collector, stood at a distance and beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, this is the man that went home in a right relationship with God. And so we invite you to pray with us a prayer of confession that we begin this day poor in spirit, as Jesus said. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we confess that we have all sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. We thank you that you are a loving, merciful God and that in the blood of Jesus Christ you forgive us for all of our sins. We pray that we may be poor in spirit today, but also rich in mercy and rich in grace, rich in forgiveness. We thank you for the cross, which covers all of our sin. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus that wipes us clean, and gives us the hope of eternal life through the forgiveness of our sins. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, God is merciful, God is just, God is righteous, and he will forgive us for all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We invite you to pray now the Apostles' Creed, a, creed, a confession of our faith, and we pray this together and acknowledge our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
This I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. This was a big part of Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And we listened to part of that letter that was written 2,000 years ago for our comfort and for our strength. And Paul writes these words in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 11. In him, that is in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works out all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And for this reason... Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of our Lord. The gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 33. Jesus said, hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a winepress in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took the servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scripture the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. When it falls on anyone, it will crush him. 
When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. We sing our next hymn, Build Your Kingdom Here. I pray you are well today. As I begin with the announcements, I simply want to acknowledge a person. Jessica Mangles, would you come over here into the camera shot? Thank you very much. Jessica Mangles, now I'd like all of you on screen to clap wildly for all of her hard work. And I want you to, in the, in the comments below, I want you to give her all kinds of thanks and appreciation. We are grateful for you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Um, 
She has been working hard for 203 days. Not that I know when this all began, but that's the case. I want to also thank you for your generosity on Wednesdays as we feed people and as we uh, present again this last week, 137, I believe it was, boxes went out. Uh, three, uh, 100 families were helped. There are lots of Bible studies that exist, and you are welcome to... Pastor Dave is the one to connect with in that respect. You also have the ability, if you want to, connect with, with Maddie about youth activities. Would mention one other thing this week, excuse me, this month, we're beginning this particular book study, Seven Men and Seven Women. Seven Men and Seven Women, Eric Metaxas, we are having a socially distanced book study on the fourth Monday of October will be our first one in that respect. We begin a new sermon series today in reference to uh, Ephesians. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask you to bless us and give us your strength. We pray for the church. We pray for the ability for us to testify to you in unusual, unusual times. And we pray that you would bless us mightily. In Christ's name, amen. I pray that you are well today, and we begin with this kind of comment. COVID has damaged our community. For 203 days, 29 weeks, we have been in this anti-community circumstance. So there are people in this room right now you see me, I see you. You pretend you don't see me, but I see you. See, the issue of when you're on screen, you think, well, he doesn't really see me. Remember when you were a kid and you watched Romper Room? Remember Romper Room? I was a little creeped out by Romper Room because I thought that lady could see me. Now, I can't see you, but I would hide behind the couch when that lady came on TV because she would tell me she could see me and that kind of freaked me out. I can't see you. But I pray you are well, and I pray that in this season, we have an issue ultimately of community. Now, here's the concept. We're in this together. You're not alone. You're not alone, even in the midst of this situation. And at the services here in person, and those of you that are in on site today, you have the opportunity to receive communion at the end of the service, if you are so inclined, you would like to, because in fact, we, the nature of communion is this is a meal of forgiveness. But as we're looking at the book of Ephesians, we talk about the big picture and the small pictures. The big picture and the small pictures. Let's take a little test. If you look at this picture that you see, what is this picture? Is this a big picture or a small picture? And what is that of? That is a granular picture. A small picture because that is a dragonfly's wing. What about this one? What would this one be? Is this a big picture or small picture? That is actually a big picture. That's called Spotted Lake. That's north of the Washington state border into British Columbia. And those actually are mineral deposits coming up through the water. Is this... A big picture or a small picture? Well, actually, that is a small picture. You might have already eaten that in the last 24 hours, as I did. Pasta. There you go. It's pasta. Very close. The last one. Is this a big picture or a small picture? Well, that clearly is a big picture. That is what they call the closest star. We used to be told when we were kids it was Alpha Centauri. But now the closest star, they say, is Proxima Centauri, 4.24 light years away, or 5.88 trillion miles. It's an incredibly large distance, the closest star. Walking to Proxima Centauri would take 215 million years. 215 million. If you turned it up and went as fast as Apollo 11 and went to the moon, it would take 43,000 years. How can you even measure such a distance? And so as we look at the scripture, we are looking from the big picture 
and from the small picture. And I want to tell you, the scripture says this, that there fundamentally is a plan. There's a plan. It maybe doesn't feel like there's a plan, but there's a plan. And I can assure you for the last 203 days, I've been trying to figure out what that plan is. Now imagine for a moment you want to do some work on your house and somebody who wants to work on your house gives you a picture and the picture looks like this. Would you hire these people? You would not hire the people because it doesn't seem like there's any kind of plan. Or imagine for a moment that you, imagine what the emotion was on this day. Can you imagine? Now, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, math matters. Because whoever didn't do their math homework right there, they got themselves in serious, serious trouble. But this is what the scripture says. The scripture completely says this statement. In him we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God has a plan in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who are the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. So what's the meaning? What is the meaning of meaning? The meaning of meaning is that we're in here for something much larger. Really. It's not just about a paycheck. A paycheck's not a good enough reason. Personal glory is not a good enough reason. Proving someone wrong is not a good enough reason. Being happy or successful or loved is not a good enough reason. The issue is, we're, your life is part of something much larger. Why are you here? You're here precisely because to bring glory to God. Your life and my life is to bring glory to God. Do people in your life think more about God because of your life? And if I might be so bold, who are the people in your life? Who's in your pandemic lifeboat? Who's in your pandemic lifeboat? Who are you willing or who is willing to take off their mask in front of you kind of thing? Who keeps this on and who will take it off? And the truth is the people in our life, right? Some are scared. Some view things as desperate and being more desperate. But I ask you this question in your life. What do you see in front of you right now? What's the biggest challenge you have? And, and do you have hope? Hope is this idea. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Can you see your life the way God sees it? I use this image as an image of hope in my mind. You're looking for a way out. It's dark. For the last 203 days, 29 weeks, there's been some difficulty, clearly. But may you know the hope to which he has called you. Consider this. Is it true hope if it's not contagious? I'm not going to tell you just be hopeful. I'm going to say God is the reason for your hope. And, and here's my prayer. My prayer particularly is, may I see 2020 in hope. God wants us to see three things. He wants us to see the plan, see the hope, and see the church. See the plan, see the hope, and see the church. For the church is the body. For God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Now, think about this. What's the church? The church are people. And what God says to us specifically is this issue. He says, we cannot truly love God if we do not love our fellow travelers on this mortal journey. We Thomas Merton said that statement. We cannot truly love God if we do not love our fellow travelers. I don't know if you know this television show. It's a cool television show. If you've never seen Bear Grylls, you should see Bear Grylls. The world's toughest race. But the best thing about that, it's not individuals. It's groups of people working together through incredible odds. And I'm going to say to you, that's what we're doing in 2020. Groups of people working together in incredible odds. That's what the church is. I'm grateful some of those people who are helping us work through this difficult time right now are in this room. And they're the ones who have more stress than even I do, which is 
kind of hard to have, actually, but they do. I appreciate you. I appreciate your hard work. People up in the balcony, I appreciate you. Because ultimately, we're going through a tough time, a pandemic time. But the nature of God is that we should know the plan, we should know the hope, and we should know that we're in this together. But he doesn't just say that in Ephesians chapter 4. He also then drills down to the granular. This, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him, accordance with the truth that's in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires and to be new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. To put off the old and to put on the new. It isn't just avoiding that which is. It's also adding which God wants. That you and I, you and I as Christians, God's not done with us. Turn to the person next to you and say, you know what, God's not done with you. God's not done with you, Cale. God's not done with me. God's not done with us. And in fact, he gives an example. He says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for you are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. When's the last time you got angry? What were you angry over? I've often found it helpful. You've heard me say this before. I've quoted uh, Norman Wright. Norman Wright wrote a book called Making Anger Your Ally, and he uses this language. Anger is never the initial response. Anger is always a secondary response. We get frustrated, then we're angry. We get fearful, then we're angry. We get afraid, then we're angry. When's the last time you were frustrated? When's the last time you are fearful? When's the last time you are afraid? And did it turn to anger? It says, in your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down, we are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. I'll confess, in the last 203 days, I have been more frustrated than I was in the previous 203 days. Absolutely true. But God says to me, in my frustration, don't let it to turn to anger, and in your anger, don't let it turn to sin. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down where you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold because the spiritual strategy here is this. The devil wants us to be angry for a time and that time will steal away from us joy and he uses it as a base of operations to hurt us. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down where you're still angry and don't give the devil a foothold. The truth is, I can be angry. It doesn't affect anybody else except really me. It has the most damage on me unless my anger comes out to other people. God says, don't let that happen. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands. They may have something to share with those in need. Because the, the dangerous position with anger is that anger actually can in fact mature to bitterness. The scripture says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God which we are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. He said get rid of all bitterness. Bitterness, anger that matures, anger that sticks around, we become stuck in it. Bitterness can feel worse than anger because in a, Dr. Jacobson said, because it involves us feeling helpless, we can feel so helpless with it. Bitterness always starts out as hurt. We're always hurt by something. And then bitterness is a chaotic, pervasive state of smoldering resentment. One of the most destructive and toxic human emotions is bitterness. It eventually defines some essential part of who we are. It's a dangerous position. Dr. Diamond uses the language. And there's a, a solution, if you will. Are you feeling like you're bitter? He says, stop. It's similar to anger, if you will. Don't give it time and don't give it place. Put your story on hold, this person says. He goes on to say, take responsibility for what you can. 
Interesting sentence in the year 2020. Stop spying. I find that to be fascinating. Stop spying. There's a study that's done that when people get frustrated with one another, do you know what they do? They look at each other's social media. And then they get more frustrated, typically. The nature of it is this. He says, get rid of all bitterness, all rage, all anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another. Because what just happens with, with bitterness? Bitterness, in fact, pickles us. We get pickled. Uh, how many of you like pickles? You like pickles? Great. I did this in the other services, so I need to ask. How many of you have ever eaten a pickled egg? Pickled egg? Really? I've never eaten a pickled egg. How many of you have ever eaten pickled pig's feet? Yeah, I've never done that either. But in the couple of services, there were quite a few uh, that... How many of you believe that pickles should be dill pickles only and not sweet pickles? How many of you believe that? That's what I believe. How to pickle anything? How to pickle anything, in essence, is we let it stew in our mind again and again and again. But God says, get rid of all bitterness, all rage and anger and brawling and slander, along with every form of malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. We look at the church and we should know the plan. There is a plan in the midst of all of this. God's plan. God wants you to have hope. I want to ask you a question. Zero to ten, evaluate your own life. How hopeful of a person are you? Zero, you are not hopeful at all. Ten, you are the most hopeful you have been in your life. I'm not asking you how tired you are in your life. I'm not asking how, how uh, exhausted you are. I'm asking you how hopeful you are. What number do you give yourself? Now, how much anger do you have in you? Zero to ten. How much frustration? How, how much bitterness? In the midst of all that, God wants us to see the largest plan, but he also wants to drill down into the reality of our own life and say, what's true? We should know the plan, know the hope, know the church, and know that God is not done with you, and God's not done with me. We're living in unusual times. And I pray for us to have patience one with another. Because God chose for us to be born in such a time where we would live through this time. This amazing time. And I pray that God would use us mightily that we might indeed encourage and build up people who need the nature of hope. So God says to us, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other. Just as in Christ God forgave you. Know the plan. God has a plan for your life and we're in this together. God wants you to see life with hope because he's God and we're not. And God wants you to know that we're all part of the body of Christ together and we are putting off and putting on and anger cannot grab a hold of us and bitter cannot, bitterness cannot have its root within us. Instead, may God give us patience. And joy and peace. As we close today, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. For yourself, for those you love. But I'm going to also ask you to pray for, for Ben Marth. Ben Marth, one of the previous pastors here. Uh, Dave and Mary Marth, their son Ben in St. Louis, ha is having a serious difficult reaction to COVID. He's hospitalized. And we as the body of Christ want to come alongside of them and pray for Ben. We want to pray as well for the President of the United States. We want to pray for Robert Kohler. Robert is going through a, a, another season of chemotherapy with the intent that he'll be able to have the, the cancerous tumor removed from his stomach. Please pray along with us for, for Robert and Rachel and Xander and Reese. We want to pray for them in this season of time that God would be able to intervene for his health. Please pray with me. Lord God, we come before you today. We pray that we may know the plan, that you have a plan, even though we can't see it sometimes. 
We pray that you give us hope that we may see life, see the people, see the circumstances the way you want us to see them, that, that you're not done with us, that we may see each other, that we are to lift each other up and encourage each other and help each other. May we be given that strength. Bless Ben Marth today. Bless the president today. Bless especially Robert Kohler today. We pray for the the treatment he'll receive this week. May it be possible that he might be able to have uh, surgery and they can remove the tumor. We ask you, Father, that you would give us wisdom on how we function in these days. We pray for our schools. We pray for our families. We pray for those who are placed in positions of leadership and responsibility. We pray for those who are on the front lines dealing with this coronavirus. And we pray for a release from the pandemic. As we gather all of our prayers before you in the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. God bless you this week.